Yeah, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all for this Tuesday masterclass, which is going on maybe like uh, more than a year now. Uh, which is brought to all the students of all like uh, all over India through Yasuda Hospital in association with ISSM Hyderabad chapter. So this is basically meant for the exam going people. So where we discuss uh, the cases, the real cases, the questions and all with the big, the big, big teachers who are there like throughout India, they are there at the moderators. But today we have a case on AIDP uh, that is like the Gulenberry syndrome. For, for discussion, we have two of our students, Dr. Rohi and Dr. Rohita, who are the DRMB students in critical care medicine in our Yosura hospital. To moderate the session, we have two of the stalwarts when it comes to <laughs> critical <laughs> care. Dr. Manimala Rao, she is the teacher of teachers. Or, uh, maybe she is the person who started critical care in India and for sure in our Tel uh, Telangana and Andhra, the Queen States. And Dr. Dr. Suvasini Tirumala, she is my teacher basically. So they are the two senior most uh, uh, like uh, teachers going to ask questions and moderate the session. And uh, I should thank from bottom of my heart to both Dr. Manimal and Dr. Suvasini to take out time from their busy schedules and uh, to enlighten us and ask some questions what we believe is going to help each and every person who are listening to this uh, webinar today. So uh, two things. One, uh, people who are attending right now, they can post their questions in Q&A in between whenever we believe it is relevant. Dr. Suvasini or Dr. Manimala Madam can take up those questions. Or at the end, we can discuss those questions. And uh, like uh, you can ask questions from the first slide itself, madam. So there is no time limit. You can uh, take over from here, madam. I will be in the backdrop. If there is anything required, I will come into the picture. Thank you, madam. Sure. Thank you very much for that introduction. And having all that respect for us, it's always nice to see all of you youngsters doing a good job now. And it really gives me a great pleasure. Okay, let us start off the case. And hello, Suhasni. Good evening, uh, madam. And, and uh, thank, thank you, Mishra, for inviting me here. And it's nice to be back with the students and then discussing about interesting cases like this. And yeah, to just, yeah, I yeah. congratulate you all for a nice presentation every Tuesday. I keep listening to them, and it is really nice, like, you know, for updating our knowledge too. Thank you. Yeah, can, can we can we start Okay. Who is presenting first? Mamma Ruhi is presenting, ma'am. Okay. Swati, close the presentation and reopen it again. My video is not there. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. It is not moving. Can you put your presentation? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead. There was a 53 year old male presented to our emergency department with complaints of generalized weakness since seven days, worsening of symptoms since four days, and difficulty in walking since one day. Uh, 
the patient was apparently all right seven days back to start with and then he had uh, generalized weakness which was gradually worsening since four days difficulty in walking since one day which was gradual which gradually progressed to difficulty in standing up from sitting position there was no difficulty in holding objects there was no difficulty in uh, buttoning and unbuttoning of shirt no difficulty in raising hand above the head no history of trunkal weakness and neck weakness there was a recent history of travel to uh, united states and ireland almost a month back and uh, no history of any trauma no history of fever vomiting cold cough or loose stools no history of bowel and bladder disturbances no history of uh, swallowing difficulty difficulty in breathing or any voice change no history of any sensory disturbances and no history of altered sensorium mm, come in the past history, uh, patient was a known uh, a known hypertensive on uh, tel telmisartan 40 mg OD and known hypothyroid on uh, thyroxine 25 mics uh, OD. And he had a history of COVID in 2020 for which he was hospitalized and he required oxygen support. And he had received three doses of vaccination. The last dose was in January 2022. So here, can I stop you? Yes. Yeah. Can you tell me from this history? Of course, you know this is the syndrome, but from this history, what do you think is your diagnosis to a great extent and why? Because there was a history of weakness, most probably mm. proximal was a weakness. Yeah. Uh, and also there is no particularly as such, uh, uh, distal puzzle weakness is not uh, not there as a, because there was uh, no difficulty in buttoning or yeah, so the proximal difficulty in walking did he complain of any pain in no, walking no pain no. okay so is it a common symptom before the onset of weakness yes yes ma'am yes so I, that is one thing you have to keep in mind when you see a patient okay what is the next thing from the history, what is that you are coming to towards? Yeah, tell me from this history till now, what do you think is will be your diagnosis and why? Ma'am, uh, patient was having a proximal muscle weakness more than distal. That's, okay. That's uh, okay, you have told that. Uh, okay. Ma'am, uh, uh, commonly it can be due to some dyselectrolytemia, ma'am, hypokalemia or any hypokalemic periodic pulse. Uh, can I ask mm -hmm. you one? Like, you know, mm -hmm. the proximal muscle weakness you're saying, but it's only the lower limbs which are affected now. Lower limbs. Yes. Uh, probably, like, you know, but how could you say, do you, you didn't examine the lower limb totally? Like, you know, did you assess, mm -hmm. like, you know, the uh, foot uh, the dorsiflexion and the yes, knee extension? Did you no, check no, that, uh, and so then he's unable to stand? Like, uh, you know, so you can say it's a proximal. Doctor, doctor yes. Swasni. Yes, I think if both of us ask questions, they'll get confused. Uh -huh, Just okay. let me finish. Uh, let me finish this particular thing. Sure, sure. I'm only asking her from yeah. the history. Yes. Can she come to any conclusion? Sure, sure. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. From the history, what mm -hmm. you have read till now, mm -hmm. can you come to some conclusion with the proximal muscle weakness? Um, ma'am, ma there was no uh, bladder and bowel disturbances, ma'am. So the scar. Yeah, there is nothing. No bladder, no mm -hmm. bowel. There are first, you yes. know, all that is okay. He's awake and everything. Only you found proximal muscle weakness. But from the history, can you come to some diagnosis in this? If not, I'll just give you a hint. Did he get any vaccination? Did he get COVID? COVID, COVID vaccine. vaccination. So that is one of the things. Mm -hmm. Have you read? Yes, ma'am. After COVID, there were a lot of cases it, of GBS. GBS, yes, yes ma'am. So that is what I am trying to ask. Because from the history, you should be able to diagnose to an extent. I am not asking you for clinical examination. We have not gone there. Mm -hmm. But looking at this patient, after this he went there and came back in a month's time, he had COVID and he has vaccinations. The vaccinations, the COVID itself, plus the vaccinations could have done this. With the proximal muscle weakness, it should go into your head that it could be. That is the reason I asked. Okay, go ahead. You agree, you know? Um, 
the COVID was like, you know, the vaccination was taken a year ago, almost like, you know, so how do you relate yeah, to that? That's okay. He had COVID recently in 2022. No, no, the, 20, third 22 dose was taken. the third dose, yeah, January. Mm, yeah. So it was long, like, you know, less than three months uh, after expo so when, we, when did he come then, here? When did he come here? What is this? He came in uh, January? No, or uh, this, when did he come? June, uh, this recent June. Uh, June. He's still in the hospital, admitted in the hospital. Now, now. Yes, yes, yeah, it's now. Yes, ma'am. So, since he went to okay, US, anyway, so, this like, is you know, Ireland. Yeah. You also have to keep in mind, because just I wanted to tell you, particularly <laughs> patients who have got COVID, you know, these people who are more prone to get this uh, GBS. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of cases reported. Exactly what is the time, I, I am also not sure. But there were a lot of cases reported. So, of course, I'm only trying to tell you that is the vaccination. You just have to tell whether it is positive or negative. It should come to your mind that these things are there. You can tell me. Yes, it had earlier. It is not right now. Like Swarasini said. Right? So, okay. that is what. Okay. General physical examination, patient is conscious, coherent, uh, oriented to time, place and person, was moderately built and well nourished. There was no palas, uh, cyanosis, ictrus, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or pedal edema. The GCS was 15 by 15, uh, heart rate was 74 beats per minute and regular, BP was 130 over 70, saturation was 99% room air, not tachypnic, uh, temperate, he was ephebrile and blood sugars were around 125 mg. C, uh, CNS examination, higher mental functions were normal and there was no speech and uh, memory impairment. Motor power, the upper uh, upper limb, right and left power show, were 5 by 5, whereas lower limb power was around 4 by 5. The tone was normal and uh, the deep tendon reflexes, they could not be appreciated and there was plantar flexors. The respiratory, cardiovascular and per abdomen uh, systems were examined and which were normal and no significant abnormality. So, what is your uh, diagnosis then? One is electrolyte. Okay. Uh, Diselectrolyte. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The other is uh, yeah. hypokalemic periodic paralysis, ma'am. And uh, the third one is GBS. And the fourth one is myasthenia gravis we thought of, ma'am. Uh, the patient was initially shifted to ward, ma'am. No, no, no. Don't go there. Okay. I have to ask you here in the DD. Can you go back? Okay. So, if you think if it is dyselectrolemia, what is the electrolyte you are thinking? Hypokalemia, potassium, so, or magnesium. magnesium. So you, you, for hypokalemia, periodic paralysis, if you ask some history, they will be able to tell you. Does it come on and off? Okay. Yes, so, that you can always take it out and say, okay, he, this is the first time he got it, yes. but still you can get it. Keep. Yeah. But if it is dyselectrolemia, it only will not be affecting only the lower limbs. Even the other limbs also, there will be a little bit difficulty in moving or whatever. So, that usually with the electrolyte, you can know that it is very easy. So, that is both of them. So, why are you thinking myasthenia? Uh, in myasthenia, what do you have? Uh, as patient was having extreme uh, weakness with uh, mm. uh, with fatigability, ma'am. So we thought of myasthenia gravis. But usually in myasthenia gravis, there will be uh, progressive weakness during uh, from morning to evening, and uh, mm. also uh, the what is one more important uh, point in myasthenia? Tonal variation. Tosis doesn't have any ptosis. Mm. Ptosis. 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 That is the common thing that it. So you finally thought you have excluded those. Mm. So when you put in a DD, you yourself can exclude. Yes. You know, yes. When you are presenting in a, mm. a case. Okay. Now I leave next one to Dr. Swasi. This is my history. From history and a little clinical examination, we have come to a point that most probably he is having GBS. Okay. Now Suhasni will be asking you questions. I'll keep quiet for a little. No, no, it's okay, madam. You ask like, you know, it'll be nice. And no, uh, this hypokalemic periodic paralysis, like, you know, history, do you have to elicit something like, you know, which yeah. is very important? Uh, 
uh, any previous <coughs> history of hospital admissions, previous history of uh, um, okay, like you know, also after some eating, uh, like mm -hmm. you know, high carbohydrate meal. Mm -hmm. So it's also important, like you elicit it, like whether he, after food, like you know, is having more weakness, and that also matters, isn't it? It is hypokalemic periodic paralysis, mm -hmm. and it's very unlikely in this case, like you know, this is an uh, myasthenia gravis. So do you think, like you know, it's like comes over? a lot of time like it's not an acute presentation and in here you have an acute presentation most probably like you know gbs as madam was telling like the lean body syndrome and uh, can we go ahead and present yeah, go ahead. the day one in what patient was shifted to what uh, routine blood investigations were uh, done in which uh, there was a uh, high tlc count noted of 15860 uh, and other uh, uh, platelets and uh, creatinine values were normal and CUE also was normal. So in view of high TLC, blood cultures were sent and patient was started on uh, antibiotic uh, septraxone, one gram IV OD. And uh, day two in what patient weakness gradually worsened, neurology opinion was sought, MRI brain and whole, whole spine screening was done, which was normal. Lumbar uh, LP was done, which was showing albuminocytological dissociations in which cells were 3, proteins were 93 with 100% lymphocyte. NCS was done with suggestive of demyelinating polyradiculopathy. In view of worsening uh, weakness, IVIG was planned and a patient was shifted to AMCO. Mm -hmm. the NCS so maybe, maybe you would have diagnosed it much earlier than that, right? <laughs> okay. If you had come directly to us, you would have diagnosed that earlier because you have put everything together is a proximal muscle weakness is is an acute thing he went somewhere and came back okay all those things and there, was there anything else you would ask in the history in this particular patient Any history of in, uh, talk, talks, any food ingestion, uh, any diarrheal illness or any flu symptoms? Yeah, so what is flu any symptoms. infection, Hello? diarrhea, or you can have an upper respiratory okay. or a viral infection or something or vaccination. That's so nice. these are the things which you have to ask. Okay. So, so when you ask those, days. sorry. No matter what. Uh, no, no, because uh, no, no. seventy percent of the patients do have some uh, history, like you know, of uh, either viral illness yeah. prior to the attack or like you know, the, some diarrheal illness. So in uh, the resource limited countries, the Campylobacter jejuni infections are very plenty. So it's very important that we elicit, like you know, the history of uh, these two, and uh, because the infections, it. like that is the reason I asked that question. Yes, influenza or any viral illness could be a probability of triggering the syndrome. So it's very important that we elicit the history properly. And then since it's been abroad and then like, you know, maybe during the cold weather, or like you know, there it is much uh, colder and could be like, you know, influenza or it could be vaccine related. You could have taken influenza vaccine there that we didn't elicit, like, you know, we should have told about it. Okay, yeah, keep, go keep going, yeah. So any other investigation you would do, you would like to do in this patient? Any other investigation? You have done uh, now conduction. You have done the CDP and you have done the CSF, which are already showed you that the patient is having GPS. So, would you like to do any other uh, test? Stool cal uh, stool tests for. Uh... Course, if we know, are uh, starting IVIG, if we are starting IVIG, then uh, we should do IgA levels. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. Apart from no. that, apart from that, apart from what that, other tests? Routine tests. Routine um, tests. <laughs> Both of us are getting serum them. creatinine. Yeah. No, that Why is serum creatinine is important. You have done serum creatinine. Yes, yes So why do you want to do serum creatinine? Because uh, IVIG therapy can lead to renal failure, ma'am. So baseline creatinine should be there. Yes. And also, liver function tests liver function also function. have to be done, isn't it? Yeah, that's also very important. Like, you know, you do it. And sometimes it's a cause of consequence. Like, you know, you have uh, altered liver functions after IVIG. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I didn't get my point. 
still. <laughs> okay. Still, I'm, I didn't get the point. You see, you have to do for them oh. HIV, HBSIG, and um, hepatitis. Well, done. It's already done. Yeah. It is important. No, <laughs> it is important to know whether these people are positive anyone, any one of them. The GBS also known to occur in patients who are positive with that. Of course, one is that it is also good to know them because they are in the ICU. We do those tests, right? Yes, so in this particular case, we have to know because if that could be the cause. Okay. Ma'am, ma viral markers we did, ma'am. Viral markers were non real Yeah, you didn't mention. Okay. So that is why I'm saying so viral what? markers normally we do. But in this particular thing, if they are positive in any one of them, that also could be the reason for developing a uh, patient GBS. You, you do know that there are very few patients all over the world, but hepatitis B you can develop if it is chronic. In hepatitis C, there are lots of patients, people reported a lot of things. HIV it is reported. So when you see these, just don't go there negative and gone. But if it is positive, you should think maybe that is the origin. Okay. Did you get that? Yes, right. ma'am. Okay. Go ahead. So which is a time like you know where you see the maximum cytoalbuminic dissociation. The After one cyto week, uh, ma'am. It starts to appear. But at the third week, like you know, it peaks. End of second week. Time. Time. Yeah. Usually at the third week, like, you know, you have a maximum, uh, like, uh, certain albuminic dissociation. And if you see high white cell count, like, you know, in CSF along with high protein, then you have to suspect, like, you know, the other HIV infection with HIV causing, like, you know, the problem. So you have to be very careful, like, you know, when you elicit the test results also. Okay, keep going. The uh, conduction st uh, study was done, ma'am, uh, which suggested uh, demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy, in which FA prolongation was there in both lower limb, which suggested of radiculopathy. There was, uh, uh, this was the uh, decrease in uh, your conduction uh, velocity and increase in uh, latency. latency was seen. Ma and FA was also seen. Mm. So the patient yeah. shifted to AMCU, ma'am. So before you go there, like, you know, can we ask like some pathophysiological questions? Like, you know, why, why does this cytoalbuminemic dissociation occurs? And like, you know, what, what is the cause? And then what is typical of this nerve conduction studies in gulin barry syndrome? Ma'am, uh, cytoalbuminological dissociation occurs because uh, the nerves, uh, the blood brain barrier uh, will be damaged. No brain barrier. No brain barrier. Uh -huh. Now, brain yes. barrier will be damaged yes. and there will be seepage of uh, proteins inside, ma'am. So, because of that, this albuminocytological dissociation will occur, ma'am. And mm -hmm. uh, in uh, GBS, uh, because of the uh, an like antigen antibody complex will be formed and uh, that will activate the complement system, and finally, the membrane attack uh, complex will be formed and that will cause this vesicular degeneration, and also the macrophages will come and remove the myelin uh, debris from. Mm -hmm. The axon. No. So, loss of myelin at the uh, roots, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, the demyelination. Demyelination. Yeah, demyelination. And subsequently, like, you know, damage to the barrier. And then it causes seepage of the proteins okay. and makes a vasization. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, that's fine. And then, like, you know, the typical uh, uh, nerve conduction studies, like, you know, there's something called a sural sparing. So that is typical of GBS, okay? The sural nerve is spared, like, you know, most of the time. So it is, uh, biopsy shows infiltration with inflammatory cells, but still, like, you know, sural sparing is one of the typical features of this one. So the F latencies are prolonged, the conduction velocities are prolonged, but uh, sural sparing is there, okay? So let's go. Patient is conscious, current? This is AMC, ma'am. After uh, shift. After the patient got shifted to AMCU, uh, this thing, ma'am, general physical examination, patient was conscious, coherent, oriented to time, place, and person. He was moderately built and well nourished. There is no paler, ictrous, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, and fetal edema. GCS is 15 by 15, ma'am, and uh, heart rate is 80 per minute regular. BP is 140-80 mmHg. Saturation was 98% room air and a, not tachypnic. Temperature was febrile and uh, blood sugars were 115 mg per dl. 
CNS examination, higher mental functions were uh, normal. Speech and memory was normal. Cranial nerve examination was normal. Motor system, it was uh, showing there is proximal muscle weakness in the upper limb and uh, as well as in the lower limb with an MRC score of 44 over 60. The tone is decreased and also the deep tendon reflexes, uh, they showed hyporeflexia. Hand grip was fair and toe grip was sig showed significant weakness. Plantar mm -hmm. reflexes were mute and there were no involuntary movements. The sensory system is intact and the cerebellar examination was intact. Mm -hmm. So what, what cranial nerves get normally involved in this, uh, you know, GBS? Uh, what are the cranial nerves? Which get facial, in... usually facial, facial nerve. Facial uh, nerve. The, the, the commonest. The commonest. Okay. Then? Or is it, uh, so, ninth and tenth also, ma'am. Balbar palsy, palsy can, be, can, can be there. Can be there. Yeah. Okay. If it is any other variety, uh, ocular uh, three, four, three. Uh, six can be. Oh, that's what. So you have to remember when a question is asked like that, you have to say in this variety it doesn't, but in the other variety where you find them, then you have to tell that the ocular numbers. Facial is the commonest. Commons. Okay, it can occur maybe if it is not there in him, but many times it happens in many people, but it just goes away, doesn't stay long. Okay. Hmm. In day one of ICU, patient was started on IVIG. His body weight was around 81 kg, so around 162 gram IVIG over five days was uh, planned. Patient attendance have been explained was uh, explained the need and complications of IVIG. Uh, patient was hydrated and 35 grams of IVIG infusion was started on the first day. Man. And uh, patient was started on IV fluids uh, of RL or plasmodite 75 ml per hour. And uh, his uh, telmisartan and uh, thyronom uh, tablets were given. And patient was started on also on uh, low molecular weight heparin for DVT prophylaxis. And chest and limb physiotherapy was done. On uh, day one to three, patient was hydrated and IVIG was uh, continued. There was no progression or improvement in his power. DVT prophylaxis in chest limb physiotherapy was continued. Uh, in uh, on day one to day three, uh, his uh, the IVIG dose was around 35. 35 and 30 were given, but his uh, single bre uh, breath count uh, comparatively was uh, decreasing from day one to day three. One 24 to 23, then 21 on day three, and what else will you see? What else will you tell your nurse <clears throat> to be careful at the bedside at this stage or whenever you have a GBS patient? Uh, Any autonomic instability mm -hmm. is more common. Mm -hmm. So when, when there is an autonomic instability, do they usually get, what do they get? Sweating, yeah. tachycardia, tachybrady, arrhythmia. So bradyarrhythmia is very hypertension. common there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Radiarrhythmia is very common. Okay, so what do you tell the nurse? Or what will you think about that? Because you are at bedside, I'm not there. We'll, we, we'll have to keep uh, an ampule of uh, atropine by the bedside. Yeah. Nurse. Right. yeah, you have to tell the nurse, dilute and keep one ampule. Atropine. Okay, that's 0.1 milligram per cc. To make it, keep it there. Mm -hmm. You have to tell the nurse that this is for that. If it is falling, to what level you will allow? Because I like to know what you do at bedside. That is important for me. Okay. Uh, okay. So do you keep it any time? Yes, ma'am. Yeah? Uh, but uh, this patient had no autonomic... Uh... No, no, whether they have or no, mm -hmm. we always have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Does it tell you and come? No, no. No, ma'am. So we don't know which patient will go. We don't know. Because he's having on the lower side only about 70. So are there any predictions yeah. like, you know, of so respiratory failure? Any, yeah. Hmm. Ma so I'm sorry to interrupt. Actually, the, there are a few questions are coming up, madam. In between, you just check the Q&A. Actually, one person from Indonesia, actually, they are asking regarding the different types of... Uh, yeah, that uh, we will come. Uh, treatments, yeah. we will uh, talk about it later. Yeah, and, please. Uh, yeah, that's all. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the thing is like, so, you know, yeah, is there any one positive? Pretty... Yeah. When do you admit the patients to ICU? Like, you know, the indications for admission to the ICU? Can you suggest, tell me? And there is rapid progression of your weakness, ma'am, or any bulbar palsy if uh, you suggest. Okay. And yeah. uh, any imp like impending respiratory failure signs if you find. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, single breath count single, less than sing 20. Say single breath count less than 15, okay. Hmm. Then, so the thing is like, you know, and any deterioration more than 30% from the previous year is also an indication for admission to the ICU. As you said, like, you know, the uh, administration of therapeutic modalities like IV, IG or plasma exchange also yeah, has to be admitted to a closed environment where you can monitor. Is there any possibility, like, you know, what are the other respiratory parameters you check, like, you know, uh, by, though it is theoretical, it will be of use for the examination point for point of view, apart from single breath count. You other you bedside pulmonary function tests, uh, uh, force Sab vital capacity. Fabri Sabri's uh, breath holding time, Snyder's okay. mat stick test, uh, uh, forced expiratory time. You do all that in the ICU? Uh, we do single breath count. Uh, yeah, that's the only thing we do. And uh, if you have a, a flow meter, like, you know, you could do that. So, what, what really, what type of a respiratory failure is this? If it happens. Type 2 respiratory type failure. Two. So, okay, if you have a, some sort of a monitor, if you have a monitor, would you like to monitor something? It is CO2. Yeah, that is, mm. if you have got a nasal prongs, it is CO2. Mm. You can monitor the it is CO2. You are not having rightly here, but in many places it is available. Okay. So that is also one way. Very easily you can monitor this patient. Anyway, let us go because others want to know about other yeah. things. Okay. Then? On day four. Uh, so he required NIV support. Oh, yes. Therefore, yeah. Therefore, patient gradually worsened. Uh, was complaining of shortness of breath. Upper limb weakness worsened, uh, and there was mm -hmm. new right facial weakness. And he was unable mm -hmm. to uh, unable to close his eyelids. The next mm -hmm. section were around three by five, and single breath count was around twenty one. Mm -hmm. Patient was requiring NIV support for a brief period. In view of his uh, travel history, Lyme serology was sent from. Mm -hmm. Then okay. next. Yeah, on day five, IVIG dose was continued of 30 grams and his single breath count was around 16 and neck flexion uh, decreased to two plus and in, he, he had inability to cough. MRT score was around 35 over 60. In view of decrease in SB, uh, single breath count, neck flexor weakness and impending respiratory failure, patient was intubated. Okay. So what was his ABG at this stage? Pre-intubation was the first ABG, ma'am. Uh, seven three okay. eight with PCO2 mm -hmm. of 42 and PO2 of 70 and bicarb of 22. Mm -hmm. Mild respiratory. Mild respiratory acidosis. There is respiratory 35 is normal PCO2. 36 to 44 is normal PCO2. He's just having more difficulty more breathing. 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 Okay. So would you like to do anything, any other test? Because PCO2 looked all right. PH looked all right. PO2 is fine, bicarb is fine. So before intubating, if you want to tell the patient relative, he needs to be intubated, not because of the ABG. Can you do any other thing? Simple bedside. Bedside. Post vital, vital capacity. capacity. Oh, simple bedside, madam is asking. Test. <laughs> yeah. Okay. His ability to cough. Yeah. Oh, ah, it's a simple cough, thing, uh, isn't the it? Cough has decreased. Yeah. Yeah. And so that we already is, the thing is, you can also, you have ultrasound? Yes, yes ma'am. So you can see your uh, diaphragmatic expression. Is it okay, normal? Ah, when you ask them to take a deep breath, how much it is? So that will also give you to an extent because I like to do that. If there is any respiratory depression, so usually the diaphragm will not be acting in the same way as it acts normally. Okay. I mean, these are these are the things I wanted to keep in mind so that this will give you a much better this thing. You tell them it has come down. So I have intubated. Nobody is going to even say a word to you, right? Because this is all 
normally a busy right yes okay so that's do what you think, I'm just uh, do you think niv will help in this kind of uh, patients uh, no ma'am no it's progress so ideally yeah. ideally though people try it like you know you should not insist on mm -hmm. niv NIV is not an option for this kind of patients. It's better to intubate them early and then like, you know, because they're unable to call early. off and, you know, respiratory mm -hmm. failure yeah. uh, progresses rapidly. And you don't know when it happens, like, you know, it requires and putting the patient... They'll aspirate. They'll aspirate because yeah. they're not so able because to Because of the inability to cough. Mm -hmm. So it's not a good option. To, you have to intubate early if you really want to intubate. Yeah. Okay, next one. And these are the uh, hemodynamic MRC score uh, from day uh, 6 to day 12, ma'am. From uh, day 6 uh, to day 12, uh, the significantly mm -hmm. MRC score has comparatively increased. And uh, hemodynamically, he was stable. And on day 9, because his uh, MRC score and other parameters uh, uh, was increased better, so we have kept him on BiPAP. Uh, on, on day 10, he had developed fever. Uh, and then on day 11, he was put on thermovent with 2 liters of oxygen. And day 12, also he was put on thermovent. Mm -hmm. Almost uh, four days you didn't intubate. No, ma'am. Uh, patient, patient was uh, intubated on day 5, ma'am. Day 5. Day 5. Day five said, by pep, by pep. No, ma'am. Okay. Patient was intubated on day 5. He was requiring mm -hmm. the ventilatory support, ma'am. Uh, from mm -hmm. day 6 to day 8, there was a progressive decrease in the MRC score mm -hmm. and the weakness okay. increased, ma'am. And uh, the MRC score uh, improved from day 9, ma'am. And uh, because of his improvement, we tried uh, okay. we, have, we have tried BiPAP, ma'am. And that we yeah. gradually weaned it to thermovent uh, on 2 liters of oxygen. And we weaned off oxygen on day 12, ma'am. Uh, in between, patient developed fevers on day 10, ma'am. So uh, these are the lab values, ma'am, which was showing normal. And uh, on day 6, uh, and before we have sent Lyme serology, that Lyme serology report turned out to be negative, which we received on day 6, ma'am. And uh, HB, TLC, serum, creatinine, sodium, potassium were uh, normal, ma'am. And there was mild increase in TLC count on day 10. And the patient was having fevers also, ma'am. So in view of that, we changed the Foley's catheter and we have sent CUE, which was uh, showing 54 parcels with leukocyte esterase positive, ma'am. And urine culture sensitivity was sent. And uh, we stopped the cefepirazone and started on injection cefepirazone sulbactam, uh, 1.5 grams IV twice daily, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh, on from day 13 to day 15, the patient power was improving gradually. His neck holding was improving. It was uh, 8 seconds on day 13, which gradually improved to more than 10 seconds. That is 14 seconds. Uh, he was able to lift his uh, head uh, more than 10 seconds, ma'am, around 14 seconds by day 15. So as the patient was able to maintain on thermovent without any oxygen for more than 48 hours and neck holding also improved and chest x-ray was also showing uh, uh, clear and we have decannulated the patient on day 15. So post uh, decannulation, ABG is, uh, look, ABG is normal, ma'am, and his uh, vitals were also normal, ma'am. BP 1 over 80, uh, heart rate 80. When was uh, tracheostomy done? I know. Uh, it was done on day 3 of uh, mechanical ventilation, ma'am. No, day actually, uh, is, uh, why, do you think it's uh, like, you know, too early? I would suggest and then, and uh, this is uh, like, you know, on day 3, we don't usually yeah. recommend. Yeah. But even uh, as per literature also, you have to wait 14 days. And then, like, you know, even after 14 days, and the patient is improving and the patient is showing, like, neck holding is better and, like, you know, the patient is going in the direction of improvement, you better wait for a couple of days and then tend to extubate him rather than, like, you know, subject yeah. to Tracheostomy is really, a, a, itself, it's a morbidity. And also, and, uh, the patient, fortunately, your patient is not having any autonomic imbalance. So, yeah, yeah. in the presence of severe autonomic yeah. imbalance, nobody would dare touch the patient also. So it's very important that you give a thought to uh, early tracheostomy. I, I'm not coming. Early tracheostomy, at least uh, seven days. You have to give them. To okay. to five. five to seven days is the time at least you have to give. If it is going to be long time, here when you are improving, then yeah. wait for a little. I wouldn't do the tracheostomy so early. I will see for another two, three days. 
if it is improving and then is coming up then there is nothing put him on pressure support on uh, your uh, ventilator leave him for a day and then you see if the cough is good and if there is no problem with the airway you can see whether there is any edema then and, and uh, fine. Uh, if the cough is good if the yeah. cough is not good then go for a tracheostomy yeah. and uh, without the neck holding properly like you know maintained uh, mm -hmm. uh, as you said on day 13 it was only 8 seconds and then improved to day uh, on day 15 to 14 seconds and then at that time to putting on thermovent itself like you know again it's a problem like you know and so any time patient can sink like you know without being wanted slowly the pco to starts so this is a ventilatory failure case PCO2 starts to raise without your notice and this you monitor and suddenly the patient stops to breathe. It happened like, you know, several times, like if you leave the patient on a uh, thermovent and then slowly the PCO2 tends to rise and then you wouldn't know what's happening, but like, you know, it's a ventilatory failure. So I wouldn't suggest uh, like, you know, wheeling off the ventilator also so soon without increasing, uh, like you know, improving the neck holding and the muzzle power. So it's very, very important. So for like, you know, identifying the patient's uh, uh, who, are, who require ventilatory support also, MRC score is an important factor. So apart from like the onset of illness from uh, hospital admission, from onset of illness and uh, two, and then uh, yeah, and involvement and also yeah, okay. MRC score. Okay. MRC yeah, score yeah, is very important. So I yes. you have got two cases. The children, like, yeah, so sure. let us not, uh, sure. then let, let us, uh, now patient is better, yeah. So now just can you tell me what are the various types of GBS, you know? Most common is the acute uh, inflammatory. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Uh, acute inflammatory, demyelinating yeah. polyneuropathy, ma'am. And uh, acute motor. Yeah, that is one. Are, the common. Variant. Yeah. Second. And, uh, acute, acute motor, axonal variant, ma'am. And acute motor mm -hmm. and sensory axonal uh, uh, neuropathy, ma'am. These are the most common mm. uh, variants of GBS, ma'am. There are other rare variants uh, like Miller Fissure variant, mm. um, phary pharyngeal, mm. cervical, uh, bulbar uh, variant, pure sensory variant, pan yeah. pandy's dysautonomia, mm. acute paraplegic uh, variant, mm. facial diplegia. In Campylobacter jejuni infections, which is more common? Aman, acute Aman variant is more common. Yeah, so that is the reason it's more associated with uh, treatment failures and then the long, prolonged recovery and uh, poor outcomes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, next. So, okay. suppose if this patient, well, you have done everything, you have given IVIG, but we did not respond to the IVIG. Mm -hmm. On, uh, you know, you have given it, you have to give it for at least five days, no? So, yeah. it did mm -hmm. not respond. Then what is your uh, method? So, he's still on ventilator. He's still having the problem. Okay. Uh, after giving five doses of uh, IVIG, okay. we have to wait and watch, ma'am. Uh, uh, if we want to do any plasma exchange, then uh, we need at least uh, 14 days. Uh, at least two weeks, we have to wait uh, to do plasma exchange. Mm -hmm. Because IVIG to act also, it will take some... Uh, four to seven so what is between uh, between these sorry so between these two like you know therapies yeah but between better. these two things mm, these two are equally effective okay so the studies showed that both are equally effective and so uh, there's no difference in the outcomes between uh, plasma pharesis and IVIG treatment. So when comparing both, like, you know, which do you think is better and then like, you know, uh, uh, more uh, feasible, uh, IVIG justify? Uh, if, if the patient is uh, worsening, if the patient is acutely worsening, ma'am, then uh, plasma exchange uh, is uh, better, ma'am, because uh, for the IVIG, to for that uh, for the action to develop uh, also for the action to develop also it will take at least four to seven days but still like you know the evidence what is the evidence now like both know, are equally are equally okay. effective uh, so yeah. both are equally effective and there's okay. no difference between the outcomes mm -hmm. and uh, so what is nothing like you know you can pick and choose it's your choice availability your expertise and then like you know safety of the patient and the presence of uh, 
autonomic imbalance and then the patient is IgA deficiency like in wherein you have to choose plasma versus yeah mm -hmm. so it's it's all like you know it's uh, your local availability and feasibility which is more important rather than the choice of therapy so uh, the as far as the literature goes like the acceptability of uh, uh, our treatment failures are more common in plasma exchange uh, i mean to say the treatment withdrawal not acceptance like because of the complications would have they would have stopped or like in you know, a patient not accepting because of the complications and but ivig is more uh, accepted like you know for care and so it has been shown like you know ivig is is equally important uh, uh, equal to that of plasma exchanges and then it's better also like you know for the use like there's no discontinuation in the treatment in ivig treatment rather than plasma exchanges that's what the literature says mm -hmm. yeah and also like you know pl the plasma pheresis what are the complications of plasma exchanges uh, along with the auto antibodies, there will be decrease in complements. Initially, procedure related complications can happen, ma'am, and uh, catheter related infections. Immediately after plasma exchange, there will be decrease in proteins, complement levels, uh, clotting factors, uh, dilutional uh, coagulopathy, volume overload. Volume so it's very important, like, you know, you monitor everything because of the extracorporeal circuit, the chance of infection, hypotension in presence of autonomic imbalance. Again, the acute profound hypotension is a problem. About IVIG, when you're giving IVIG, what are the precautions you take and what are the contraindications? Initially, we need to hydrate uh, the patient, ma'am. In mm -hmm. to hydrate the patient and uh, initially we should start the IVIG infusion with uh, with a slow drip rate ma'am like 0.4 ml per kg per minute we need to start and we need to check for any reactions and after, if there are no reactions for the next 15 minutes then then we can gradually increase and uh, maximum we can increase up to 6 to 8 ml, ml per, uh, per kg, kg per, per minute. minute. So what are the complications like uh, yeah, five yeah, hyperviscosity uh, hypotension uh, hypotension reactions or hyperviscosity also is most common one like stroke or m m m m i um even the thromboembolism and in iga deficient individuals there can be serum sickness hypersensitivity reaction also yeah. what will happen to the anion gap if you're doing abg on this kind of patients or receiving ivig Normal anion gap. Uh... No, she is asking you what happens to the normal anion gap is always there. Normal and give, it can go negative. No, mm -hmm. so it can go negative because of the immunoglobulins like which are being infused. This is an exam question like in the show in a uh, with a ABG with a negative anion gap and then ask you like you know and you have to relate to the. Uh, treatment and then you have to tell like you know probably this patient is receiving immunoglobulins all right so it's very very important that you okay. is the patient okay yes. has he gone home uh or is it still we have okay? decannulated yeah. the patient today itself ma'am so yeah uh, for the shifted to the ward no ma'am uh, no ma'am no. today, today we only we de decannulated no, still mm. today Okay. We can let it, ma'am. So our further plan uh, is to slowly start the patient on oral uh, diet, ma'am, and we'll continue the chest and uh, mm -hmm. limb physiotherapy and uh, de-escalation of antibiotics, and we'll shift to what? Okay. So is he able to sit now without support? Support is, is needed, ma'am, but he is but with support he is able to sit. Ma support is needed. That's what I said. So he is able to do that, and so you have to continue to do the physiotherapy. Physiotherapy, yes. What will you again monitor for this guy when you send away, and the first day when you go, you will see him, no? In the ward, or do you see that? Yes. Go to the ward and see that. At least on the first day. Yes, ma'am. So what will you see? Uh, any improvement in uh, in the power? Hmm. Any further complications like fevers and mm. they are present or not, ma'am? And you uh, check his lungs. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Look for his deglutition again. Mm -hmm. How is he swallowing reflex? All these things you can check so that at least you are satisfied that you have sent and he is okay. Okay. What are the other supportive care you need to give to these patients? 
and then like you know the bowel movement is also very very important you may have to give some laxatives laxatives yeah and also neostigmine which itself like you know leads to bradycardia which can like you know misinterpret your autonomic imbalance and you have to be very careful okay so you have to be like you know watching all the things and nutrition is very very important okay so all this care like you know also is very very important when you address this kind of patients so is the first case over anything more we have to tell what, what are the phases like if how long uh, the patient is at risk like you know for all the problems in bullion barry uh, in the first week uh, of uh, illness there is a risk uh, due to the disease itself ma'am for the progression of the muscles respiratory involvement ventilatory failure and all from the second week mm -hmm. is at risk of bed sores uh, lung complications dvts and the normal uh, catheter associated of, uh, yeah catheter the normal associated course infections of, the normal course of progression of this is like you know three phases like you know where the patient will be at risk for respiratory failure until two weeks mm -hmm. and then it plateaus at two to four weeks and then after four weeks usually the patient starts to recover mm -hmm. like you know you have to be very careful even if the patient goes to what it needs continued care and then like you know continued observation like you know until uh for until uh, three to four weeks like you know you, you have to be very careful not that you have to keep the patient in the icu for so long but you have to give a leave a note of caution to these patients in the wards and then like you know subsequent and also to the relatives you have to yes. explain to the relatives so these Possibly, are going to be the yeah, problems yeah. Huh. and to watch out for them so if hmm. you tell that he'll be more safe because the nurse may come once and see but if you tell these things to the relatives watch out for these you know hmm. change them you know talk to them and see whether they are coughing all these little things if you tell the relatives they will do those things in a better way okay so sometimes we forget about that and then we tend to tell only write down and then send them okay shift it so that is the thing which you can do anyway so he did not have any um hospital acquired infection Uh, he had yeah, urinary tract. Uh, yeah, urinary tract infection, catheter acquired infection. So, do you take all the care for the catheter in the ICU? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. So then, why did he get it? It's only three, four, day, four, five days. Uh, on or ten days. When did he get? Tenth, tenth day. Tenth day. So, when do you change the catheter? Use. Usually, when fever comes. Now, what's your procedure? Uh, if the patient is showing any symptoms, if within after seven days, we'll change the catheter, ma'am. It's not time bound. It's only symptom related, and then it's not, whenever you mm -hmm. suspect so, infection, see. you have to change. And when you change, you have to change the entire bag, yes, the police yes. bag, and everything. All the system should be changed. Okay, it's not the question of only four leaves and then keep the bag. So everything has to be changed. And uh, okay, like you know, your patient has been discharged from home. Is that discharged from home? Uh, is just is going just ready to go. Okay, yeah. fine. Uh. So next case, what is it, ma'am? Ma'am, we are pre presenting only one case, ma'am. One okay. case. Oh, okay. They said um, uh, both of you are presenting, so I thought there are two cases. Uh, so then we can, can ask I... you some more yes. question. Yeah. Yes, yes. So actually, ma'am, ma sorry. Uh, hmm. Actually, there are few questions. Like uh, hmm. I think they are basic questions only, which hmm. have been asked by people who are like attending the session today. Yeah. One of the question from uh, Dr. Aditya uh, hmm. that was like. Uh, we know that ivg therapy and plasma apheresis are commonly used in treatment of gbs what are strengths and weakness mm. of both of them mm. can we combine both or we can we only choose the better one yeah 
So I think most of the things has then been discussed. You can't combine both. So, so, can, okay. I, can I summarize that? Like, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so normally, like, you know, usually both are equally effective. There's no use of combining. Like, there are studies, like, you know, using combining also, like, you know, there's no better advantage of combining the therapies except for escalation of the cause. And after, like, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of each, like, you know, it depends upon the local availability and, like, you know, the expertise of use, like, you know, and the patient factors, which could be a contraindication to the use of one or the other therapies. Just like for plasma pheresis, the patient autonomic imbalance, hypotensions, and the patients, like, you know, they, become, they can become coagulopathic and then a lot of problems there, risk for, like, you know, bleeds and the patient will have a lot of problems like you know if uh, the, co the cost of therapy though it's considered a little less compared to ivig therapy the acceptance of care is much better with uh, ivig therapy and then okay. ivig like you know is for patients uh, is contraindicated only in patients with iga uh, problems and then hemolytic anemia so we have to be very careful and combining both is not a, a, an option at all like you know we should not usually do combine immunotherapies and we can some, there are some studies like after plasma pheresis, it, patients were given IVIG, but there was, there's no evidence of any benefit in these kind of patients. And uh, uh, then giving, doing plasma pheresis after IVIG treatment, again, like, you know, it's a problem. You lose it. will not help, like, the patient, you are going to remove the IVIG, which is already there in the circulation by putting the patient on plasma pheresis and diluting it more. And the benefit of giving IVIG is lost. And so, like, you know, again, it is not associated with improved outcomes, short-term outcomes also. And it has been associated with increased cost of care. So that's what is the evidence now. And then so, like, in you know, IVIG, after IVIG, Again, like, you know, so for some patients, despite no evidence, people tend to give in patients who are severely affected and do not, who do not respond. And again, plasma exchange after plasma exchange also can be done only in selective group of patients who do not respond to treatment and who are less than eight weeks. Like, you know, if the uh, weakness is prolonging beyond eight weeks, then you have to consider the differential diagnosis for other reasons like CIDP. So where, like, you know, it may not work so much. So it is like, you know, that uh, you have to pick and choose either one of them and then be done with it. Or rarely yep. when in severe cases. And then therapeutic yeah, failures or relapse after therapy. Therapy-related relapses, like, you know, are possibility. There, people have tried a lot of combinations and then still there's not much of effective, like, outcomes. This kind of... Yeah. Can I say uh, two, three words about it? Yes. In, uh, whatever is my experience, we know that both the therapies are equally good and you can use it depending upon you know, where you are in some places. Now it is more and more IVIG that all of us know. And if at all there is a possibility, you may have to do it a little later. But there are some cases. See, IVIG, if given in the early, that is within at least a week, it works much better. Okay. And it makes it more improvement comes. Suppose if the patient has been somewhere and he comes, with a tremendous amount of weakness and, you know, almost on ventilator, when they come after 10 or 15 days, maybe you can just do a plasma pheresis, one or two this thing, and then go for an IVH. At least you bring down the load of that quickly. And, That's yeah. the only thing which can be th thought of to yeah. look at. But otherwise, mixing these two things is a big one. Actually, when you uh, start it, if you have started IVIG, you go with that. Wait for some time. If it still doesn't come, and if you think it is still aired, if you only, then you can do it after 14 days plasma first. But once between when you are giving IVIG, you cannot do plasma first. That's, yeah, that's the, the final final uh, line will be there is no role of combining both. IVIG and plasma exchange, both are equally effective. If you are giving IG, IVIG, the dose will be 400 mg per kg per day for five days. Yes. And there is no role of giving beyond five days for six, seven, or eight days. Yes. If you are yes. thinking of plasma exchange after yes. IVIG, you are going to remove all the IVIG what you have been given, which will be effective for four to six weeks after giving IVIG. 
yes if you have done plasma exchange uh, the first at, uh, first attempt which usually we do like uh, 1 to 1.5 times of plasma need to be removed every time when you are doing it. Yes, sir, they yeah. suggest if you are doing plasma exchange, there are few uh, papers suggesting when the GBS is progressing very fast, maybe plasma exchange might be effective more than IVIG because it can remove yeah. quickly the antibodies. With one cycle only, we can remove up quickly. to 60 to 70 percent yeah, of antibodies, maybe. We can do frequent instead of alternate day, daily plasma exchange for two or three times can remove almost 90% or beyond antibodies. But per se, at this point of time, we don't have clear cut evidence for that to suggest. Madam, one more question similar actually. This is a patient of GB uh, received nine cycle of flex or plasma exchange. Weaning is difficult. She is still on ventilator dependent. Yeah. But neurology suggested IVIG. I wanted to understand if it will be helpful after almost one month of flex and two months since diagnosis of GBS. Hmm. There are some one or two papers like you know, which are saying you can they gave like IVIG after flex, but the benefit is not much, like you know, they quoted and, uh, really. and the outcome really. benefit is not there. So how much it will help? Like it will it's again one on one basis because there's not much evidence, and so. It's really difficult to answer this question. Yeah, and after really... and also the number of cycles of plasma has also been explained, and it is said like you know beyond six there's no use. So it uh, there is a good paper no like you know it says less than two it's not of use. Two to four may be useful. More than six not at all useful. So they say four to six cycles is good enough for a patient like you know beyond a uh, doing eight and all maybe you'll induce complications of uh, uh like you know uh, causing thrombocytopenias and then like you know the anticoagulatory mm -hmm. coagulant related mm -hmm. problems and then fibrinogen depletions all that can occur like you know you have to be very 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 careful like you know with and, doing for and, long time. and and that too madam the time frame yeah so as for the natural course of the disease we believe mm -hmm. they progress uh, maybe maximum time frame they have told is around one month. After that, there will be a plateau. And after yeah. plateau, they should improve over a period of time. Sure. That too, not every person. Correct. And it depends on the severity of the disease and how they're responding to the treatment. If it is Aman yeah. and Amsan variety, they don't usually respond that well to your plasma exchange or IVIG. After two months of diagnosis of GBS, I don't think there is a role of even Any flex or GBS. But yes, yeah. this patient can develop CIDP. At that point of time, maybe steroid will be helpful. That yeah. might that might be the answer for this question, madam. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there were a question regarding uh, like if pos is it possible GBS patient to undergo percutaneous uh, tracheostomy to be discharged directly home from the ICU? How is the management? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Unless they are so rich, they can have ICU at home with an intensive. Okay. So basically, basically, actually, if the two reasons why somebody can die out of GBS is one is respiratory failure and second is severe autonomic dysfunction. Yes. Autonomic, that's what autonomic dysfunction, severe autonomic dysfunction, and respiratory failure are the two more than uh, failure is autonomic imbalance which kills the patient. Like no, if, suddenly if the respiratory failure, failure not diagnosed at right time, yeah, we already would have put the patient on ventilator because ICs yeah. are smart these days. So we would have so, put the patient on. But yeah, if the patient is not stable enough, there is no uh, there is no way we can discharge a patient after doing a tracheostomy. Like yeah. in our case, madam, actually want to just uh, because it is. My our case in our ICU only. Actually, he started deteriorating after five days of IVIG. Actually, till that time he was relatively okay. He was maintaining well. On day five onwards, he started worsening. His power went down. His respiratory weakness worsened. His neck neck holding worsened. So day six, day seven, we need to intubate that patient, and we need to do tracheostomy after day ten of uh, uh, of intubation. Means after three days of intubation because he was worsening progressively. After IVIG, somebody is worsening, we believe it will take a long period of time. Luckily, that fellow, after three or four days of tracheostomy, started improving. I don't know how, like, uh, <laughs> this is so fast improvement. Like the okay, no, you Mishra, can't expect I want to say one thing. Just one thing. 
See, when you do a tracheostomy after the three days, there's no need, isn't it? We can always wait. The early tracheostomy is seven days. Okay? So, after seven days, you call it late tracheostomy. So, you can do a tracheostomy. Is a brain, uh, you know, a TVM. So, for those patients, you do by fifth day. But I'll take at least five days to see whether they're coming out or not. Then I'll do an early tracheostomy. I will definitely wait for 10 days. Like, so I don't for think a it's required. Uh, I, no, that. because, okay. like, you know, treatment uh, response, like, you know, per se, 40% of the patients do not initially. Uh, it will take a little time. Time. It will take a little lot of time. And then, uh, uh, so he says, wait until two weeks after your therapy and then address. So whether it is really failure or no, you have to wait like, you know, for some time. Maybe your patient would have improved and then it could have been extubated, we don't know. But still you have to wait, like, you know, 40% of the patients do not improve. You cannot call it treatment failure again. Like, you know, they say it will take some time, like, you know, for the addressing. So uh, yeah, one yeah. study they did, uh, uh, recombination therapies, and then they gave another therapy after nine days, within nine days. So that's, uh, that's the reason, like, you know, they could not benefit, uh, see the benefit at all. So it could be a possibility that could have uh, waiting for a little longer time and then two weeks after the initial treatment, then, like, you know, deciding about another treatment would be a better option maybe in this kind of cases. Correct, madam. <laughs> Like, uh, there was a question, role of steroid, and uh, if yes, when to start? Steroids, no, no, for, uh, like... No, no, now, the, now the steroids are a big no. But in the 90s, in the late 80s, it was steroid which was given. Because I can tell you my own story, if you want to listen. I had GBS. So, it was in uh, 89. So... I also had a hepatitis B from a patient. So from that, there were one or two references to hepatitis B and, uh, you know, GBS. So that's the reason I keep asking that, though there are not many this thing. And we have also published one. Okay. True, true. Like that time, I was having a lot of pain and weakness in the proximal, you know, weakness was there. For one or two days, I was thinking, what's wrong? There was a little tingling and a little bit of, uh, you know, pain among these uh, in the uh, muscles. So I was thinking there may be just uh, nothing, but uh, weakness was tremendous. I feel just like not even getting up. So that was the thing. And uh, I was uh, later on admitted and slowly I was thinking I was going into respiratory failure. At that time, methylprednisolone came just into the market. I don't know, my brother is a neurologist, so he gave me that. And the symptoms totally disappeared. I do not know what it was, but the symptoms slowly came down and uh, I also was flown to Bombay for plasma versus, but I did not require. So I'm just saying you you know it's uh, her name was there in Yeah, but the thing is like, you know, nowadays, so, uh, what uh, I'm trying to say is, no, you don't. You don't. But, uh, but what actually is uh, GBS? Why does it happen? This girls, can you tell me? Uh, it's an acute uh, flaccid paralysis. Inflammation. No, no, that is okay. Why does it happen? Molecular, so mimicry. molecular mimicry, mimicry. mimicry because of your they develop auto antibodies against your own myelin sheath proteins mm -hmm. myelin proteins yeah so, so immunological auto -antibodies antibodies. Auto -antibodies. and yeah so it is a so autoimmune sort of a thing yeah it doesn't know that it is destroying its own myelin mm -hmm. okay that is the thing so some amount of when you have an autoimmune disease some amount of steroid usually they have given in those days but now they have shown that steroid is not working except if it is, it has gone into a chronic stage or the chronic uh, CADP or whatever you call them. In I that level, they mm -hmm. give. But In anecdotal reports, like, you know, they I mean, say you can, it is combine, not, you can combine yes, with other therapies, immunomodulator therapies, but mm. per se, steroids have not much role because they're more associated with infections and the glucose control goes heavy, like, which is again a factor for more yeah. demyelination yeah. and worsening of very high dose. 
chest only yeah. one or two doses if at all there is a lot of pain and there is a lot of uh, severe gbs yes. along with ivig maybe but i don't think now you don't have evidence so there is nothing like giving it right so any more okay. questions mr har can we go yeah, madam one or two questions uh, most of the yeah, like, uh, treatment related questions we have discussed uh, the difference mm-hmm. between myasthenia gravis and gbs in weakness proximal versus distal yeah it's like you know no well known isn't it like you know it's more uh, uh, the ocular muscles getting involved and then uh, it's a descending kind of paralysis like initially the patient gets and then more fatigue with the descending proximal paralysis. muscle weakness And in GBS, it's more like okay, after this, the reflexes are intact in myasthenia. Intact. So it would be like you know, eryflexia or hyperreflexia is more common to hallmark. But even oh. reflexes can be preserved in GBS. It's so difficult. Again, like maybe uh, your adrophonium tests and all that, but it's very very difficult. Like you know, nobody is nobody is doing. So we have to be careful. We uh, trust on nerve conductions and then go with the nerve conductions. Yeah. Actually, there were two more questions. One was like, what all medication we should avoid in a patient who is a case of GBS, or if we are giving anesthesia, what kind of anesthesia yes. or precautions yes. we need to take when it comes yes. to a patient of GBS? Can Ruhi answer? <laughs> Ruhi, you intubated the patient. Ruhi. Like, you know, what are the drugs you use to Doctor Ruhi? Oh, we have a rapid sequence intubation, ma'am, uh, with uh-huh. fentanyl uh-huh. and uh, rocuronium. Uh, We have okay. used, so it's very good. Like you know, use rocuronium because succinylcholine again, like you know, we have so to avoid. Neuro- Nowadays, you are not using succinylcholine. Have you seen it? No, no. So, Still, they have no, they have no succinylcholine now. So no, but like you know. Gone. That <laughs> really, the, but still, it has its yeah. own place. Like you know, you cannot ventilate the patient while giving rocuronium is very bad. Anyway, and uh, so. For, uh, Yeah. Everything we are using rocker right now. Are any so, other drugs? And the autonomic imbalance is very very important. Like you know, when yeah, you have it, it's very it's difficult uh, for intubation. Like you know, you have to be kept re- keep ready with all the drugs to support, uh, like you know, the cardiovascular system, like noradrenaline, or like you know, you may have to give vasodilators. So everything should be get uh, like you know kept ready, and then we have to start going. Like otherwise, you will be in a panic. You might lose the patient because of the severe autonomic imbalance while intubation itself. So it's very very important. Even percutaneous. Oh, can we can we combine medicine. lignocaine and magnesium for intubation? Mm-hmm. It's a good one. You will not have a problem, and it does not affect any other thing, right? Again, the same problems all over. One more yeah. similar question, yeah. madam. Like, we have one patient similar. presented with GBS, started plasma paresis, two sessions done, found to have HIV, CD4 <clears> count of hundred. What is the next plasma uh, paresis or IVF, so and when to start ART? Yeah, uh, I, I am not a specialist in ART, but like you know, usually as an IC person, we don't start ART in an acute phase of illness. Like you know, we just yeah, wait for we some time and then do it. Even if the CD4 count is low, we wait for some time. We wait for some time and the patient. You take all precautions for yourself and the other patients. You know, have. Everything done. A plasma paresis. Prone for testing. infections, but yeah. like usually we don't start yeah. ART in the acute illness. Uh, to, uh, to regarding a plasma exchange versus IVIG, when the patient of diagnosed to have HIV with a CD4 count of 100, I believe we uh, like uh, we used to believe plasma paresis can uh, worsen sepsis, but at this point of time, if you see the APSA guideline, ah. Uh, The ASPA yes. guideline of 2023. They have given even in sepsis you can do plasma exchange, which can help patient who is of sepsis and uh, like severe yes. sepsis. Yeah, they have used hemadsorption. Hemadsorption yeah. filters them. So in this fine. case, to say that uh, plasma paresis uh, is not a good thing when the patient is having HIV with a CD4 count of less than 100 doesn't make sense. We can just still continue plasma exchange even if the patient is having maybe signs of uh, like uh, immunosuppressed state. Uh, if patient was on IVIG, you can continue IVIG. Or if plasma yeah, paresis yeah, has yeah. been started, we can continue with plasma paresis. Yes. Later on, you can turn over to IVIG. And uh, like uh, now, we have discussed regarding maybe uh, Dr. Rui and Roita. Can you just tell in detail about the different types of uh, GBS? I think Amma Namsan you have told, and AIDP you told. The other parts 
include Miller Fisher variant, sir. In Miller Fisher variant, there will be a reflexia, uh, ophthalmoplegia, and uh, also ataxia. Attacks. Can we give this plasma pharesis and IVIG treatment for Miller Fisher variant? If it is mild, we usually uh, don't give it, ma'am. If a mild variant, we usually don't give it. We'll, usually, it results on its own Miller Fisher variant. So, what that's is it, like, you know? uh -huh. Becker stuff. With encephalitis uh, features with uh, Miller Fisher uh, variant included. Anything you can do to diagnose it to be Baker step and so on. Okay. Um, and um, G, GQ1B and antibodies. antibodies. Mm -hmm. Mostly Baker step is associated with Miller Fisher variant. There will be ataxia, ophthalmoplegia with encephalopathy. Encephalopathy, yes. Okay. So if these three things are there, we may think because it's a brainstem which is got involved. Here, there may have signs of brainstem encephalitis also. Miller, Fisher, Becker, Stiff, and all there, the role of IVH and plasma exchange is questionable, but we still, if patient is thick enough, then maybe we can try. The role in Aman and Apson also is questionable. Only in AIDP, there is a clear cut role and there is clear cut signs of improvement. The reason why we give, uh, just to clarify, the reason why we give IVIG or we do plasma exchange in a case of GBS is not to improve. It is only to the stop, the, stop the progression of the disease. Yes. So we should not think that we started IVIG in three days, four days, patient will start improving. But at least patient should not progress. But if patient is progressing, then we don't know. Like we shall we say it to be a treatment failure or what next need to be done is always a questionable thing. But at this point of time, the data suggests if you give IVIG, continue for five days, give the two gram per kg, the total dose and stop there. Plasma exchange, as Madam told clearly, four to six cycles. After that, there is no role of further dose okay. plasma exchange and there is no role of combining both. So that's, it's very well understood. Steroid has no role, only in CID. That's it. Okay. And better to watch out. And in an early way, you intubate the patients. Because yes. if the cough reflex is not okay, I would intubate my patient early rather than late. Because unnecessarily, there will be aspiration pneumonia and you will go into again some ventilatory, you know, associated pneumonia. Why you want to get all that? Intubate. Then you see if it is improving, you give at least about a week for it to resolve because you have given already IVIG in the third or fourth day, five days over, and then you intubated in the third day, give another five days. If you're improving from the respiratory effort and or you, you can see that it is, excursions are better than these things, cough is not uh, that much, so lungs are very clear, then slowly you can, you know, reduce and then any final comments, madam? No, so another final. thing is outcome. Like, you know, it's uh, very important that when we are staying in the ICU, the relatives ask you, like, how the patient is going to fare and what are the, like, you know, factors, like, which predict the outcomes. Like, it's very important. So, can Ruhi tell, like, what are the factors which contribute to poor outcomes? Uh, ma'am, there is a scoring system, uh, ma'am, modified uh, Erasmus uh, scoring system, which mm -hmm. uh, looks into the, uh, within how many days the patient is yeah. hospitalized, the any previous uh, history of diarrheal illness is present or not, and also the MRC score. Uh, yeah, poor, poor MRC score, diarrheal illness, and yeah. age, which is age also is very, mm -hmm. and uh, severe mm -hmm. present, present at the time of presentation to the hospital, like, you know, More than and it's less than seven days. Seven days. So within the onset of illness, the patient presence to our, our ICU is also an important factor. And more severe weakness, the bulbar involvement, and like, you know, is not responding. Yeah, all these factors like are very important to remember, like you know, because the relatives keep asking you um, uh, how the how is the patient, like you know, because they're putting a lot of money for IVIG or plasma pharesis. So we have to address which are the patients who are likely to get poor outcomes also, it's very important. That's at least our work. They should be told what should be the prognosis. 
and uh, not that all patients who come they will go back it all depends upon how they have come and when they have come with what they have come. so these are the three things which you have to constantly watch out for and if it's taking longer time then maybe they will take there will be wasting there will be you know bed sores now how much you try even when they go to a rehab center they may be living there for a lot of time so that's all but most of the time we do see if we have seen it early that we have seen that there is a better improvement and we have given whatever the necessary treatment and we have looked after without you know extra bugs being added then it's fine it will take some time as you always will get some other problems so these are some of the things which we can so sometimes they come even with seizures <laughs> we don't know there are some cases which reported so we really cannot say that exactly what is the prognosis depends upon how the patient presented when and you know what are all the various things in the patient and how quickly we could start the treatment and what is the prognosis that is all within 5 days many times you don't see there is not much improvement on the 7th or 8th day then you will see that there is some improvement in your scores so that means there is improvement so then we can tell okay there is improvement at least this is maybe it will do but it will take time to get him off the ventilator that is what is the main if he is not on ventilator then it's good let me add it have a problem came out so that's why i am still here talking to all <laughs> okay so so no more questions mr can we no, say it uh, yeah madam uh thank, thank you everyone and uh, thank you madamala madam and swasini madam taking out their time and uh, giving us such a beautiful show asking and uh, discussing their uh, like experiences that is more important than what we learn from uh, books books is up to some level can teach beyond that only patients can teach us so with that i think we'll conclude i should thank uh, dr ruhi and dr vita to coming up with this case and uh, all this discussion yes. and i thank each and every person who has joined today and maybe afterwards who is going to see this uh, webinar done well and uh, all the best for your exams okay thank, thank you. you very thank much you. thank you very much mr thank you. for inviting thank me you. here bye thank you. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you mr venkatramna all of you okay thank you and uh, bye bye ruhi and uh, thank you ma'am thank you ma'am well done bye keep up your discussions thank you bye bye so much bye bye madam bye ma'am